All right. Thank you for everyone for coming tonight. This is our live town hall with Dr. Lisa Welch. I'm running for the U.S. Congressional District, Texas 12. Tonight we have Jeremy Sins with us, who's running for House District 91. And we'll start with uh, Jeremy giving us an uh, introduction of himself. Hey, everybody. Uh, my name is Jeremy Sims. I'm running for Texas House District 91, like Dr. Welch said. So I want to thank her and her campaign for having me tonight. Uh, it's just one more way that we can continue the effort to try to uh, get our message out during this time when we can't go and knock on doors and things like that. So thanks for having me. Uh, I am a dad, a husband, small business owner, and I'm just a regular Texan who saw that there were some things that were going on in the Texas government that didn't seem like they represented me. And since it, we are supposed to have a representative form of government, I decided to do what I could to make that change that I wanted to see. So I decided to run for office. Uh, I ran for this seat for the Texas House in 2018. And I'm running again in 2020. One of the most important reasons that uh, we are successful, I mean, one of the reasons that I came back for this um, is because I am committed to seeing the change. And one of the best ways that we can make long-term change in the state of Texas is to flip the Texas House from uh, Republican control to Democrat control. Um, that changes a lot of things in the state legislature and how our government works. Um, but most importantly, if we're able to flip the Texas House in this next election uh, from Republican to Democrat control, then we as Democrats would have a say in redrawing our district lines that affect the voting for every candidate up and down the ballot in the state of Texas. This would help kind of reduce our gerrymandering that we've got going on um, and bring a little bit better representation, in my opinion, to uh, the state of Texas. So uh, I am, like I said, a small business owner. I work in IT and I solve problems all day long. So I come to politics from uh, not just a political perspective uh, where I'm completely one way or the other, but I really come to it with a heart of a problem solver where I analyze what's going on, the history of the problem, look at what are reasonable solutions that are not super extreme one way or the other, and try to think outside the box and implement solutions that would uh, benefit the majority of the people. So uh, I try to be Obviously, I'm partisan because I'm running as a Democrat, but I like to say that I am a common sense Democrat who really wants to represent everybody in my district, not just people who typically vote for Democrats. Okay, thank you. And so one of the reasons we're doing these this series, last we had Vance Keys, and then we have Jeremy Sims, and we will have Kathy Bratz on in a couple weeks. And the reason why we're uh, inviting all these local candidates in is because it's important for us to realize and each of these candidates we've talked to have this nonpartisan idea of common sense solutions that we think that most people ascribe to. Most people want to see a change in healthcare. Most people want to see a change in the way that our central workers are paid. We think they're common sense solutions. Obviously, we're running as Democrats, but we see them as a nonpartisan issues that we want to work through. And as such, we need to make sure we make a sweeping change across Texas, yep. from every single position to our, from our judicial candidates, all the way up through Senator and President. We want Texas, we want to send a very clear message that the people want some of these common sense solutions to occur and happen. Yep. So yep. let's talk about uh, Medicaid because that obviously with COVID-19 healthcare is really on the forefront of everyone's minds and how we manage this in Texas is very unique in this respect because when the Affordable Care Act happened, there was this option to expand Medicaid and okay. Texas refused it, even though it was not going to cost Texas in the beginning anything. Right. And even now we would only have to be paying for 10% for of it. The government would be picking up 90% of that. And we left a huge number of people uncovered. So let's talk about that. Yeah. Yeah, it, and during this time, it has just been shocking to me how quickly people have come around to the idea of, hey, you know, everybody should have health care when it comes to this coronavirus that's going around. So uh, I think that's a great idea. And in fact, I think um, that should be the case, not just for coronavirus, but for all health care. So um, it also, 
Um, here's where I come to this. So uh, I was um, really got plugged into politics and started paying attention to healthcare um, during the 2008 election when President Obama ran, because I have had every type of health insurance um, that probably is on the market. I've had HMO, I've had PPO, I've had no insurance. Uh, I've had insurance through the marketplace and I don't even, maybe I haven't had catastrophic insurance, but I have had a healthcare savings account, all kinds of different things. Um, and regardless of what plan it was, every year my cost seemed like it went up by double digits. Um, and so when the idea of providing more coverage to more people came about um, through the Obamacare plan, it just made sense to me because I saw it as a math problem where just everybody knows how insurance works. The more people who are in the pool, the lower it drives the cost down for everyone because there are more people to um, spread out the risk. Um, and the fact that this came uh, to America as a former Republican plan, um, a lot of people don't remember that this was basically Romney care. Uh, it was a plan that was uh, put out by a conservative think tank, right? And so mm -hmm. Uh, right. This originally should have been workable for everybody, but it became this giant partisan fight. Um, and it turned into um, a division of the haves and have nots for healthcare. And so taking driving that further down into Texas, where now Texas didn't accept the Medicaid expansion dollars, we still, Texas has the highest number of uninsured people in our country. Uh, those are people who are using the most expensive form of health care because they put off any preventive care or lower cost care and then end up going to the emergency room, which when they don't pay their bill, we end up paying the bill anyway. So we're mm -hmm. still paying for it. We're just paying for it in a more expensive, least, less efficient way. Uh, I don't think that's right. And I think that if we had people in the legislature and a governor who would sign off on it, we could have better health care in Texas. Right. And one of the things I see, so there's actually 5 million people in Texas that are un, uninsured. Yeah. And one of the things that I see with universal health care, and I like to call it universal health care because I, you know, they like to say Medicare for all. And I don't really, the Medicare has problems. We know it has problems. Um, I helped my aunt this fall get her supplemental plan. Um, she's in her 70s, she started working when she was 14. She paid for something her entire life and now she has to buy a supplement to go with it. So, so to me, that just seems um, ridiculous. Um, so I'd like to see some kind of universal health care that we implement. And what that does for us is actually as a society, it frees us up to do so many things. Cause like you, I've had health, I've had all kinds of health insurance. Um, my husband is self-employed, so literally I am the healthcare provider in my, in my family. So um, I always went from job to job. And a lot of times I took jobs that I wouldn't have taken or I would have done something different. I might've stayed home for a period of time, but it was that driving force of always having health insurance. And so this is basically holding our population captive from being able to be more productive, actually, more imaginative, more entrepreneurial, small businesses. People are afraid to take that leap out onto their own because they don't have health care. Um, so I think it's just something that we should be doing for everyone. It makes common sense that nobody should have to um, not have their care covered for. And you brought up a good point with people going to the emergency room to get their health care. That makes us pay for the most expensive form of healthcare that we can provide. So if you have a person who has diabetes and they're not able to manage it because they don't have health insurance and then they end up with the emergency room with a crisis, you have all that crisis care. They may end up in the ICU with their crisis care. Um, eventually they're gonna develop kidney failure, end up on dialysis. That is way more expensive care than if we had just provided that underlying support care all along. So. Healthcare for all is a, is a huge thing right. that we need to work I, in society. When we talk about healthcare uh, for the state of Texas, I always like to bring up um, the healthcare costs for teachers because my wife works for Bird Bowl School District. So we are on the same insurance that all of your teachers in the district are on. 
Um, and so I know a bit about how that works and I know how expensive it is. And I know that even though we pay our teachers a, a good starting salary, um, when you pair that the cost of healthcare with the student debt that students have when they come out of even a state school um, and you add cost of living and raising a family and all that kind of thing, it's really almost unworkable for, um, for us to recruit and retain teachers in the state right. yeah. of Texas because of the cost of healthcare. And that even follow, uh, follows over into the cost of healthcare for retired teachers in the state of Texas, where we haven't been keeping up with the cost of living increases for them. And they're having to choose whether to put food on the table or order their medicine. And right. that's not right either. Yeah. And I don't know about your wife, but I noticed that every year when I get my cost of living raise, my insurance cost goes up by ex almost exactly that. So I don't ever really see a raise. Um, so, yeah. so one of the questions on uh, how can we protect our local medical workers and healthcare providers after this crisis is over? So we didn't really talk about how this crisis is actually affecting our healthcare workers and uh, what kind of protection we're giving our healthcare workers. Any ideas there? Well, I think this um, falls into the category of workers' rights. Um, I am all in favor of protecting workers and giving them more power. A lot of times that's done through unionizing. Um, that really is not very popular in the state of Texas. And it's not as popular as it could be because uh, the people in power don't like for unions to have the power because then that gives them better bargaining power and the ability to control more of their destiny. Yeah. And I think one of the things that um, we should be looking at is what for healthcare providers, any, anything we do, whether it's our first responders, our policemen, our healthcare workers, anything along those lines, when we expand their hours, when we don't have enough coverage there, we put them at higher risk because as you get tired, you start making more mistakes. So if you're wearing these protective coverings, your PPE, your masks, and you have these really long shifts without enough coverage, you have too many patients, then obviously these little um, small errors are gonna slip in to that. Um, also, you know, having shift changes where there's enough overlap. Oh, we lost Jeremy. Hopefully he'll be back in just a second. So give us just a second, we'll find Jeremy. Um, but with this whole healthcare thing, um, if you had enough to overlap in these shifts, because I know a lot of my healthcare worker friends, one of the things that they're very concerned about right now is taking this COVID home with them on there, even though they're, they've been wearing their PPE all day long, you have to assume the fact that their clothing at some point came in contact um, with this virus and then they're having to take this home. You, you hear about nurses stripping outside their house and changing in. Jeremy's back. Hey, Hi, sorry about that. That's okay. This the whole technology thing, sometimes these things happen. But so with the these nurses, you know, if they had a different working environment where they had more shift change time, where they could be changing their clothes at work, showering at work, then not having to worry about taking this home. There's so many working conditions that we could be improving if we were thinking about our workers instead of trying to eke out every second of productivity out of them. Um, so, you know, them being able to organize and tell us what they need, what works for them um, is what we need to hear. We need to hear from workers and we need to be listening. And that usually means that they need to organize and have their voices heard. So and that's how we're going to best protect them. Let me just also add, if we had better leadership at the top, whether that means at the state or federal level, they could be doing things that are, again, thinking outside the box. Like we have this entire travel industry with hotels that have tons of rooms that are not being used right now. Right. And we also have both tons of uh, people who are infected and medical workers. And neither one of those groups of people need to be around other people that they love and care about during this time. Mm -hmm. We could be housing them in those empty rooms, but I haven't seen anybody organizing that effort. Right. Yeah, there's been no organized effort. I've seen um, some individual hotels offer that. There's yeah. a hotel in Dallas that's offering that. 
there's an RV Facebook page where people are offering their RVs, but it, yes, it could have been this whole huge effort of offering these rooms to people who didn't want to take this virus home. Um, so that kind of thing. We can be much better organized, you would think. Um, it's kind of like this reopening the economy. One of the things they keep talking about is reopening. And there's, there's a lot of layers you have to think about in this reopening the economy. If you can't test everyone who needs to be tested, honestly, you can't reopen because you don't know who's carrying the virus, who's taking it into work. You, ha you have to be able to monitor that. You also I have to have a tracking system where you know who they came in contact with so you can quarantine appropriately, or again, you're just spreading. And then the next thing you need to do is offer pay, paid sick leave, which is one of the things we keep talking about. So people will actually stay at home. Um, so they can stay at home and not go to work if they have these symptoms. So anyway, yeah. you were gonna add something, I think? Uh, I don't know, I spaced on what it was. Oh, okay, that's fine. So let's see, we got that. All right, so we have a question that says, transition to single payer managed care, much like Kaiser Permanent Day, I guess, which began in California in 1938 as employee health and gradually expanded by first including families of employees and then local population emphasis on preventative care. I think that was a statement and not a question for us. They're just saying we could mimic something like that. So yeah. We want to get to single payer. There's a lot system. of things that we could do, and to be honest, like there are so many people who are so pro market, it it boggles my mind that there are people who are so pro free market system um, that will not go with the idea of having a um, a like option that's provided right. by or at least single payer pr provided through the federal government that would compete with private insurance plans and make them. Right have to compete with that quality right. of people. I mean, there's just, there's some easy, there's some easy, more logical options, like having a public option, having transparency and pricing so that really you can go online and see what an X-ray costs at X, Y, and yeah. Z. Um, this, it shouldn't be some guesswork. I mean, literally three people could go into a place and ask what a, an X-ray costs. And it would probably be three different answers um, depending, so we need to, that that's kind of stuff needs to stop so another question do you have concerns about static populations that are vulnerable vulnerable and are risk to us all such as jail inmates and also nursing and retirement home residents yeah absolutely um i have a grandmother who's in assisted living um and i know what it's like to be worried about people um who are confined, but the people who are caring for them are not, and they come in and out, and those facilities get deliveries by delivery people, and you never know what, uh, what dangers are coming in and out of the facility. And we really have got, our oversight of uh, nursing homes and assisted living centers has already been terrible in Texas. It's been mm -hmm. underfunded and um, undermanned. Uh, and there really just isn't enough oversight there to begin with. And this only makes it worse. So uh, it, the, the state that we're at right now, I can only see the, um, the losses increasing um, as far as those populations go. And that is even more so for jails because our private prisons in Texas um, are for profit. And when you have a situation where people are profiting or corporations are profiting off of incarcerating people, their, their main motivation is to uh, do it at the least cost possible so they can maximize profits for their shareholders or their owners. Um, right. So all, all of those are bad incentive models. Right. Particularly when you're getting paid not by your performance, but because of how many heads of people you have in the place, you know, so I um, you know, there's a lot of models that allow us to have different models of assistant living that have nursing homes that would basically allow us to have done better, better job with this that would have allowed us to have social distancing within those places. We wouldn't have had nurses hopping from one. That was a lot of the problems we were seeing is you would have nurses that worked in multiple facilities 
And therefore, if you've got an outbreak in one, it was just getting transmitted to the next. Um, so a lot of those models don't work well. And it has to do with the fact that they're just profit. They're not thinking about performance. They're not thinking about outcomes. They're really thinking about that, that money. So um, same with, you know, um, the assisted living for disabled people that we're seeing going on in Denton right now. Um, so there's a lot better models that would work if we were less concerned about people turning a profit off our health or our lives or our liberties. So, okay, we're seeing that black communities tend to be more vulnerable to COVID-19. When in office, what do you both plan to do to solve this issue? So I'll start. I think the one of the main reasons that black communities are higher risk is, let's just take it back to healthcare. They have been underserved through the healthcare industry. Therefore, we know the vulnerable population has underlying disease states. And we know that high um, hypertension high, or high blood pressure is higher among our black communities. We know that diabetes is higher amongst our black communities. And so then that obviously makes them vulnerable right there. And those diseases are untreated. They're ongoing, preventable, um, well, not preventable, but some cases, but treatable, manageable. And if we were managing that and they were getting the access they needed, they wouldn't be this high risk population. We're leaving people behind. We're leaving whole communities and whole segments of our population behind. And we need to make sure that we're covering everyone. I think there's another angle to that too. Some of the, um, I, I am not a medical professional and I defer to you and other people who know more about that than I do, but some of the re reports that I've been reading, which are still just um, very small subset reports, they're not finalized or definitive in any way. Um, but some of them have indicated that the number one driver of fatality with the COVID-19 um, is obesity including extreme right. obesity. Yeah. And so for those communities in particular, how many generations has it been where they have not had access to fresh fruits and vegetables that they live in food deserts because in this quote, in this free market system, it goes, the companies go where the money is and the money is not going to those poor neighborhoods who need access. Um, and when you lose access, you lose the, uh, generational knowledge of how to then prepare those foods and how to eat healthy. And so a generation after generation, the problem gets worse. We're not going to solve this problem by just making diabetes treatment available. Right. We need to solve this problem by ensuring that everyone has uh, available, affordable access to healthy foods and then knows how to prepare them and give them to their kids. Right. And, you know, and that I know when I went to school, that was one of the things we actually talked about. We seem to have lost it. We actually cooked in class, not just home ec. I mean, literally all of our classes had little cooking classes and it was something you were expected to learn was how to cook and how to prepare different meals, balance diets. We seem to have lost that from our education system. Um, like you were talking about food deserts. I talk about this with my student and nutrition students all the time is that a person can be considered malnourished and still be obese because malnourished means you're not getting the proper nutrients. And so um, you have a lot of people who come in with vitamin deficiencies and mineral deficiencies because of this diet that cheap food is mac and cheese. I mean, that, that has no nutritional value for the most part. Um, so yeah, we have this huge discrepancy in what foods are available. Um, to everyone. So, and so as, as it relates to the COVID-19, we need, that's a long-term answer, but short-term, you need to have, like you said earlier, widespread testing available for free for these communities so that they will know who, if they're infected at all. And also something that we didn't mention, and I don't know that it's um, being talked about a lot anywhere, and that is the possibility of reinfection. Uh, there's been some studies out of, I think, South Korea, where people who previously had uh, the coronavirus and then cleared, and then now they are retesting positive again to the same thing. So that, and with mutations, I, I, it, it just boggles my mind that we're talking about reopening at any significant rate. I understand that we are in a very difficult spot, but 
before we can have that conversation about reopening at any big number, we need to have strategies in place to mitigate these dangers to especially vulnerable populations. Oh yeah, right. And as a scientist, I'm gonna be interested in following this whole reinfection thing. And I have been watching it some, and they think what's happening is that it actually goes dormant and then comes back out. So you didn't really ever quite recover from it. You just got like a reset, you know, um, it just kind of went down a little bit. So you have this periodic outbreak of it instead of actually having cleared it and gotten rid of the virus. And that's why you're coming back and testing positive later um, for it. So it, we don't know everything we need to know about this virus to be reopening on this broad scale um, that I think they're wanting to do. I mean, it is difficult to tell people to stay at home and to do without an income. And that's one of the thing, reasons why we need to make sure that these federal dollars are going where they need to go. And so with small businesses, we need to make sure all small businesses are, are have access to those, not ones that just have a great relationship with some big bank. And we need to make sure more of it's getting pushed down to workers because they're the ones who need to decide. They're the ones who are going to start panicking and wanting to go back to work and opening the economy. And that's for, for a rightful reason. If you're not feeding your family, if you're not paying your rent, if you're worrying about your car payment and everything else down the line, it's hard to hold that let's stay at home line. So. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. If you, if your kids, if whether your kids get to eat at night or not, depends on you going to work, whether any of you are sick or have symptoms, you're going to go to work. I know I'm a parent. That's what you have to do. Um, because in Texas, you know, there is no mandatory uh, sick pay out there. We can do better. Yeah. Okay, so one of the questions is, is what are each of your thoughts on continuing education and expanding community college access for local constituents? So Tarrant County has a great community college. I love Tarrant County Community College. Um, and I don't see any reason why we as a county could not make that available to any high school um, graduate who wants to go for two years to Tarrant County Community College um, in this in this environment where it is so hard to not graduate with massive amounts of student debt, and it's also hard to get a good paying job without a college degree, it seems um, unconscionable to me that that is the state of our system. Right. Well, I am obviously a fan of community colleges. Most of my teaching career is at community colleges. And we have the Tarrant County Community College System. Um, Parker County, which is part of Texas 12, has Weatherford College, comes on up into Wise County. And so um, firsthand experience, one, if we're going to offer that for free, it reduces student debts. It's an easy way for us to reduce student debt, to reduce student loan, um, and get those students started in a very positive manner towards that college education. A lot of these schools, their two-year degrees are things that we really do need. So they have all these vocational programs, healthcare workers included. We talk, when we talk about healthcare workers, we talk about nurses a lot. That's a two-year, you know, they can get a two-year degree there, but we talk about respiratory therapists with COVID, that, that's huge right now. Um, so, and that's a two-year degree. We have trades, they have trade vocational, so they have plumbing and electrical and building and all of these things that are great paying jobs that they could be doing through the community college. So we could be doing a lot for our economy, a lot for our students by supporting the community colleges. Absolutely. And I will just, let me just reiterate that I understand that not everybody um, is suited, wants to go to college or needs to go to college. But if they have, if people had the opportunity to go to Tarrant County Community College for two years, even for one year, if they went and tested it out, tried to see if it worked for them, um, that would be a low risk way for us to give that opportunity to people, even if they didn't have the money necessarily to go out and do a four year degree right away. Right. So St Stephen Haley made a statement. Um, so his concern is that he hears people who have employer health care. Um, it's not so much, they're not so much for the all taking away their plan that the employers are taking advantage of public option just to drop their plans and leave the employees on their own. I think that what we need to make sure is that 
when I look at this, I see that, the, that my employers are paying about $1,200 a month for me to have health care. Then I pay another $500 a month. So if they either keep paying that 1200 in and covering your, that much of your public health option, or they give you a raise. I mean, we as the public must demand that our employers continue to pick up that portion. So. Yeah, and so if you're looking at it from a marketplace perspective, I would say that um, one of the big problems that I have in evaluating and making healthcare coverage decisions is all I get to see is the, the premium amount, what my copay is gonna be, and that's about it. I have no idea how much money they're making and profit on the back end. I don't know how good the provider network is that they're gonna have because it changes. If you haven't noticed, your doctor may come on or go off contract with this particular healthcare plan uh, on a yearly basis. And so that's part of the problem with this um, healthcare system that we have is that we don't have um, consistent coverage and we don't know how much uh, we are benefiting by uh, participating in it. We don't know how much their profit they're making off of it. If we had a public option, all of that information would be publicly available information. And I have a feeling that when that cam comes out, it's going to drive down the cost of healthcare, even for people who get healthcare through their employer, uh, because they're then gonna have to compete with an efficient plan. The overhead, um, the overhead costs on Medicare uh, and Medicaid is, wasn't it like two, 2%? It's very, very low. Um, and so when, when other plans are going to have to compete with that, it's going to be interesting to see what happens. Right. And one of the things that I think if we move to this public option is that I think the advantage that the public option should offer is that there's no network. Because I think having these networks is what's driving a lot of our problem. It allows these insurance companies, so if you have huge insurance companies, they have huge negotiating power with the hospital doctors. You have smaller insurance companies that are in smaller networks, they have less influence. The networks are part of our problem because you can't move. I mean, if you have, you know, if you have a stroke on one side of town and your network provider is out, not in that network, you have a problem. Um, so the whole network system is just, I think, a disaster. Okay, um, Marilyn Kepner. Let's see. Has background is offering uh, has background in offering healthcare. Benefits from companies tend to only use Medicare as a template, but don't give all options, and the cost trickles down. Would you consider increasing community-based health coaches, which could be someone other than a nurse? This helps create jobs. Yeah, I I think the whole community-based healthcare is or health coaches would be a great thing. Um, I am very much for when we do this healthcare for all, hopefully trying to implement some kind of system throughout our K through 12. So people are getting more information about health. The healthier we are, the more health choices we make, being having access to a healthcare coach, all of that drives down our costs in the healthcare system. Yeah, I would say that uh, I agree with what you said. I would be. In, I don't know enough about that situation to know what kind of oversight there is or training that's required for those positions. Um, those would be my concerns. But in yeah. general, uh, more access to healthcare. I'm in favor of that. All right. Okay. So, question for each of us: um, When you first decided to run for office, what values guided you in your decision to run? So. Uh, Wow, I have a really long story about that and I'm not gonna give that story. Um, you'll have to check me out at another time for that. But uh, my, the core values that I was brought up with um, were to treat others the way you wanna be treated and to look out for those that have less than you. Uh, and as I mentioned earlier, uh, I when I was considering running for office, there were things going on in the Texas legislature like the bathroom bill being debated like the show me your papers bill that got passed. And those, it just, it hurt me as a Texan to see that that was my representation at the legislative level because 
those do not line up with my core values. And I will tell you that uh, having gone and talked to thousands of people at their door during both last cycle and this cycle and asking them what they care about and why they vote the way they vote and who would they consider voting for, there are so many people who, even if they lean Republican, um, they really want someone to represent them and that they know is going to run, not just run for office, but when you get in the seat, do things that will benefit them and their neighbors and their kids and grandkids. We don't have that now. And as I look at the situation as a problem solver, one of the root causes uh, that I see uh, as the reason that we don't have that type of representation is that we have so much corrupt money in the politics uh, in Texas. We have, there is no maximum uh, campaign donation amount in the state of Texas. So anybody could donate any amount they want to from my race, which I know is different from the federal, but even, even more, I, I think even more corrupt than that is the PAC money that gets flooded into these uh, campaigns of people who are incumbents and sit on committees that are going to pass legislation six to 18 months from the time that the donation is made. Um, it, it is legal bribery is what it comes down to for me. And as a problem solver, I think that if I could get elected and if I had a wish list of one thing that I could change, it would be that because if we could root out the corrupt money in politics in the state of Texas, it would give a fair shot for regular people like me to run for office and try to do it because we want to represent the people, not big donors and special interest groups. Right. So I got in because I'm a scientist and I started seeing them disassembling science and disregarding science and they were passing laws that really had no scientific basis and it started bothering me the climate denial um, some medical decisions that we're we'll be making, disassembling the EPA. Uh, Trump has asked for cuts to research every single budget. Um, and just that really bothered me. And then the second thing that bothered me was the partisan politics and the us against them. And we're all separate and you can't like each other. And we don't agree on things because when we start actually talking to people about their concerns, we all have a lot of the same concerns. When you talk about healthcare, there isn't very, very few people are actually health ha happy with their healthcare, with their insurance. They know people who've had to give up their retirement or whatever for healthcare. There's just so many things we can talk about. And as you brought up with the, the Affordable Care Act, that was a Republican idea. They literally based it on that three-legged approach that had worked. And because it was now a um, something being submitted by the Democratic Party, they just completely abandoned it. It was like, we've never, never thought of this. It was never our idea. And, and you see this all the time and you, you really do see it on both sides. You can go back and look at legislation that was introduced by one side. And now that the other side has decided to pick it up, they're against it. And that has to stop. We can't move forward as a country as long as we can never come to the middle and agree on logical solutions to common problems that we all have. And that really bothers me when people will not cross that party line and talk to each other and come up with those common sense solutions. And I do think a lot of that comes back to the money. And that's another thing that I, we, we should be representing people, not PACs and not corporations and not, not somebody you can write. Well, they can't write me a half a million dollar check. They might can you, but they cannot me. <laughs> um, but, but you know, they, they think they write this big check and they somehow own a vote some, some point. Um, so we need to be representing. That's how our whole government was set up was this representation of people. Um, the other thing that bothers me is that we've gotten away from this division between the three branches. You know, there's supposed to be a legislative branch and an executive branch and a judicial branch, and they're supposed to check and balance. And we've lost that. It's partisan now. Whatever party's controlling those, they all 
work together and they don't check and balance. We've seen this happen quite recently. So that's what's, that's why I got in. I'm just, I, you know, people are like, oh, it's such a mess. I don't want to get in. And I finally decided it was such a mess. It was time to get in pretty much. I'm over here giving you a virtual high five because I love everything you said. So, you know, I mean, if we all stay out of the, as long as you keep avoiding the mess and keep closing your door on it, it just stays a mess. People like us need to get in there and, and try and do our best. So, all right. So follow up from Marilyn. You are so right, Jeremy, about changes. Need across the board to physicians and advanced practice providers with their agreement to participate in quality review. And whether you know or not, those reviews are ongoing by health insurance providers. So that was a statement, I guess. I don't see a question in there. Marilyn, if you had a question in there, please well, rephrase and we'll go there. <laughs> okay, I do have something to say real quick okay. about that. Um, because this is one of the things that uh, my opponent really touts her um, efforts to try to um, get independent practice for these um, advanced practice providers. Uh, and I will say that I don't disagree with that idea in principle, but I will say that as our current system stands, um, there is not enough specialized training required for those providers to be able to uh, make sure that we are providing safe, effective care uh, for, for people who are receiving the care. Um, those providers are governed by the nursing organization um, and not the medical organization that doctors um, are overseen by. Um, and so this is a whole, this is kind of an in the weeds issue, but um, I am in favor of having more providers out there who are providing quality care. But I wanna put that caveat on, on there that we can't just um, turn people loose after they have taken an online course only to get their advanced practice credentials um, and then have them go off and uh, give care to anyone for any specialization that's out there. Because right now that's the situation that we're in in the state of Texas. And I will say that uh, one of the things that's often brought up on this is that if we were, if we were to make this easier um, for these advanced practice providers to um, get certified and do independent practice, that they would solve this rural healthcare problem that we have. And that's just not true because just like everything else in the free market, these providers are gonna go where the money is unless we at the same time incentivize them to go out there because the money is not in rural area healthcare. The money is in uh, Botox and doing things like that the, where you can charge a high cash payment upfront um, and not have to worry about getting reimbursed through Medicaid and Medicare. Right. So let's talk, I know you wanted to talk about um, the gerrymandering and our, because that's one of the things that's coming up now is redistrict, redistricting and that's kind of your your domain. I don't get to do that, you get to do that. So let's talk about that. Yeah, so um, after every census, so every 10 years, uh, we get to redraw the district voting lines in the state of Texas. Um, so that is coming up after this, la this coming election, like I mentioned earlier. So that is why so many people in the state of Texas are focused on trying to flip the Texas House uh, to Democrat control. Because uh, if that is the case, then we get to have a seat on that group of people who get to uh, take a first stab at drawing the lines uh, for those districts that are going to affect our elections for the next 10 years. Um, and if the way that the districts are drawn right now there are very few districts who that are winnable. They're usually either heavily Republican or heavily Democrat. I don't think that's healthy for our democracy. It's not healthy for debate. Uh, it, it is part of the reason that our state has been divided so much. Um, because and it, and it also has a side effect of turning off voters because if you continually see that one side is only going to win the election, why do you even need to show up to vote? And it hurts people like me, who is running to represent people, be able to get to have a seat at the table and a shot to win. Um, so we need to have a nonpartisan effort to draw these districts. It can be done algorithmically by computer programs that already exist. It has been proven. And I would be in favor of either that or a true nonpartisan commission 
uh, to draw those lines so that they are not gerrymandered one way or the other. Right. Yeah, and I see that point with it because when you have, even if it's strong, a strong democratic, and they we've drawn it to be a blue, you know, district that doesn't allow people to participate and it drives us away from those common sense middle solutions nonpartisan behavior so um we and we saw this in wisconsin recently because wisconsin has had this huge issue with how their districts were drawn and that led to them having to go out and vote without being able to vote through mail-in ballots so let's talk about mail-in ballots and how we should be able to vote by mail yeah, so this is something that everybody in the state of Texas should be uh, paying attention to. It's not something that gets covered on the news because it's coronavirus 24-7 right now, but there has been an effort by the Democratic Party to try to make sure that every Texan will have the ability to vote by mail if they want to. That's a little bit different than how it has been in the, in the past because there's a provision in the code that allows for uh, people with disabilities or certain other um, circumstances. And one of those is, is illness where you are allowed to uh, request a vote by mail ballot. And uh, the, so the Democratic Party has been pushing hard for that to be accessible to everyone. Um, Stephanie Click, who was the chair of the elections committee in the Texas House um, and is currently the chair of the GOP caucus uh, in Texas, requested a ruling from um, the attorney general and he uh, yesterday or today dropped his uh, opinion. It's not a ruling, it's an opinion. Um, and his opinion basically analyzed the code according to Oxford Dictionary and then came down to the decision at the end that no, we don't think that being afraid of catching coronavirus is a sufficient reason for Texans to be able to vote by mail. Well, courts have already ruled uh, come out with an actual ruling that contradicts that. So this is going to get legislated just like everything in the state of Texas that has to do with voting goes. Um, but this is something that really can make a difference. If you want to be able to vote in November without having to go to the polls because you're afraid of getting infected, uh, I think you ought to be able to vote by mail. Um, and so there, there isn't really a whole lot that we can do. You can call your legislators and um, tell them how you feel about it, but the, the Texas legislature is not in session. Um, and I don't see any of our elected officials uh, at the state level, speaking at uh, chair of the house, chair of the Senate, uh, the Lieutenant governor and the governor, I don't see them coming down on the issue, the side of voters in this case. Right. And uh, again, it is frustrating on who, who you call, who you talk to when Texas has this legislation every two years, but with the vote by mail, we, as Democrats, we need to not think of this as a Democratic subject. You need to be talking to your Republican friends, neighbors, everybody. They all have to go out and stand in line to vote. We're all just as susceptible to this disease. This isn't just um, one side of the ticket wanting to not be exposed to a disease. This is everyone we're exposing every, to, to this virus. And, you know, they keep talking about the fact that this Co you know, COVID-19 may basically resurge in the fall because of the weather change. This is not the time to be playing with our democracy and not letting people have access to their vote. So. That's true. And I did, I, so I, maybe I misspoke earlier because I said there wasn't anything you could do right now about this, but that's wrong. What you can do right now is point out to every single person that you know, especially on social media, about how the, our state leaders are failing to protect Texans during this time. Right. And especially when this is scary for people to go vote in November, you can then go back to those people and remind them, hey, do you remember when this was getting decided? We as a state had the option to make voting safe for Texans and we didn't. Right. This is not the time to be, you, hold, you need to talk to your neighbors, friends, social media. This is something we all want is voting by mail. Um, so one of the questions we had to um, was medical marijuana policy or marijuana in general. So where are your stances on that? I'm in favor of uh, especially medical marijuana being legal in the state of Texas. Uh, my opponent really likes to tout her fake medical marijuana bill that um, started out treating people with one specific condition in the state of Texas. And then this last time got broadened into a few more conditions. But, you know, this 
this approach is leaving out people like our veterans who have served. Um, they raised their hand and were willing to give their life for our country and now have conditions like PTSD and are still unable to access the medicine that they need to be able to live a more normal life. Our vets have a super high rate of suicide and anything that we can do, especially access to natural medicine, I am in favor of doing that. And the Texas legislature has failed uh, at doing that and they have had enough chances. We should have already had medical marijuana out there. If you wanna be angry about something, let me just tell you that you may not be aware, but there's a state just to the north of us that a lot of Texans really don't like to be compared to and they think that that state is not desirable, the state of Oklahoma. And I will just tell you that Oklahoma is ahead of us on this issue. They are more progressive than the state of Texas. They have full medical marijuana there and we don't. Yeah, exactly. And so on a national, from a national perspective and con congressional level, I would actually go as far as to say, I think we should legalize marijuana. Um, Obviously, we understand that there's health concerns with marijuana. There's health concerns with smoking. There's health concerns with overeating. There's health concerns with alcohol. Um, what we're seeing, and we, we tried this with alcohol. We tried prohibition. That did not work. And what it did was basically drive an underground black market and criminal um, enterprise. And that's really what we're driving with marijuana right now. Um, a lot of our enforcement efforts, a lot of our um, border patrol efforts, our prisons are filled with minor marijuana offenses. Those things just don't need to be happening. Marijuana hasn't, there's been a lot of research on it and it hasn't been shown to be this nasty, horrible drug out there. It really is equivalent or even maybe less significant than alcohol as far as um, problems that we see in society. So we're spending a lot of money policing something that we could actually be making part of our economy. And additionally, one of the, the problems we have are these um, people who have substance abuse issues. And so we're talking about our um, opioid addiction levels in the United States. You could, well, the way you solve that is making sure that you have enough substance abuse programs and sub substance abuse spaces for people that as they want them, need them, they can have them. So with marijuana, you can tax it. You can then have all this substance abuse levels because literally somebody comes clear for two minutes and goes into a substance abuse and wants to get into rehabilitation, you don't have a slot or a bed for them, you have lost them. They had a moment of clarity and you turned them away and then we're not gonna get them back for however long. We have to address our substance abuse in the United States. We need to have a clearer head and mind about how we're going to approach that, so. All right, Marilyn has a question. So there are PAs, there are NPs I trust more than some doctors. Would you support the additional continuous education of NPs? Definitely, I love nurse, nurse practitioners and PAs. Um, I think they're a very valuable part of our healthcare system. One of the things I like about them most is that they have a tendency to have more time to spend with their patients and they have a tendency to have more time to educate their patients. And when we educate our patients, we get more compliance from our patients. They actually take their medications and do the things that they need to be doing. So I think that's a great idea. Think. Ditto what you said, totally in favor of that. Okay, so. Um, Gwen, you asked, what's your thoughts on local control? I think we're going to need a little more clarification on local control of what. So we'll wait a second on that and we'll just go to another question and come back. So if you'll tell us what you want local control of. And so what, 
Um, well, what are your strategies and tactics for supporters to help in the next two months? So how are we gonna get through this the next two months as a campaign? Um, yeah, so I think I could take a stab at the local control if, if that's okay with you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, all right. So um, uh, one of the things that the state of Texas has been doing session after session um, is passing laws that overrule laws that are passed at the local level. Um, for instance, the people in the city of Denton decided they wanted to ban fracking because for whatever reason, uh, they put it on the ballot, they voted on it, and they said, nope. We, are, we don't want fracking in our city limits. And then lo and behold, the next session, the Texas legislature came and passed a law that said, oh, you can't pass a law at, your, at the city level that says that. So um, that's just one example. I understand that that's an example that generally leans to the left because it's about the environment and involves oil and gas. But I'm telling you, this is not just about that issue. It's about all kinds of things, um, including how we fund our schools. Um, so I am, I understand that local control used to be a quote Republican idea, but I got to tell you the people who are easiest to elect and then unelect are the people at your city council. So it makes sense to me that um, if those are the people who are most responsive to the citizens, those are the ones who generally are going to make the best decisions for the citizens. So I'm in favor of that and I think the state needs to keep their hands out of the city's business and then which by the way, they then turn around to DC and say, you shouldn't pass laws in DC that override what we wanna do at the state level because we should have the power. And it's just double talk that is wrong right. at every level. Yeah. You do see it at every level. The state's telling the federal government they shouldn't intercede and then the, the city's telling, and really we need the, the closer your control is to home, the, the better it is because you are probably neighbors with the person on the school board. So you can go talk to them. You're probably, you probably know the city council member. You can actually go to your city council meeting. The local, your more local your control is, the better it is for you. So, um, so Diego says, if you had a hundred people you could organize to fight for one issue, what would that issue be? Ooh. Wow, a um, hundred people, I guess it depends on how they're gonna organize, but um, my favorite root cause issue is trying to get corrupt money out of politics. But the one that I see most likely to get the most momentum to get us over the finish line is probably pushing for real medical marijuana in the state of Texas. Uh, people are passionate about that. It is a bipartisan issue. It crosses every single boundary I can assure you that you know someone who uses marijuana if you're in the state of Texas um, and those people need to organize and they need to vote and I want to help them do that. Right. I would say my top, I have two tops, but my absolute top is healthcare. Uh, mainly because I teach anatomy physiology, I teach healthcare workers, I see it all the time. I really don't see a single individual or person who's not affected by health, the healthcare question. And I just see it as this huge nonpartisan issue. Everyone should have health care. We should not be denying anyone access to basic care. They shouldn't be losing their homes. They shouldn't be losing their retirement because they were unfortunate enough to have a disease or a sickness. So that's my root one. Um, secondly, then goes over to environmental and the fact that we honestly know there, I don't see how you can look at the COVID-19 and the pictures people are now putting out there about the clear skies over Los Angeles and the clear skies over, you know, all these populated cities and people can see for miles now. You have channels in Venice cleaning up and the dolphins are returning. You have wildlife in places they've never been. We know we're the problem. You can't deny it anymore. <laughs> So now we need to approach this and fix it. So, all right, so three minutes left. So let's wrap this up. What do we want people to do for us for our campaigns? So I would like everyone to go to my website because that is where all of my links are. The website is votesims.com. That's B-O-T-E-S-I-M-S.com. And you should be seeing this. They're coming up, I think, in Facebook. Yep, yep. so go to votesims.com. I'm going to make sure and say that three times, maybe one more. 
And then uh, there are different links on there. I have an app that we're using for our campaign that's really cool because it lets you connect with different other Democrats who want to represent you and are running for office. And that'll increase as we get closer to the uh, election time. Uh, you, it kind of gamifies being able to campaign. You can campaign from your couch. Uh, you can read things that I put out. You can text your friends messages that we suggest that you text or you can edit them yourself. Same thing, you can email your friends directly from the app. Of course, campaigning costs money and I am running a grassroots campaign that is not taking money from medical packs and insurance packs and things like that, special interest groups. So as I mentioned earlier, I need your money and there's no limit in the state of Texas, but most of my donors are giving 20 to $50 a month and that is how we're running the campaign. So I really need you to hit the big blue donate button that is on the website and get involved. And again, because it's a grassroots campaign, we need your volunteer hours. So please click on the link to help out with the campaign because we need that as well. Okay. And literally, we're all gonna say the same thing is we all need a lot of the same thing. So yes, I want you to go to my website, lisawelch.org. It's an easy one to remember. There's links to our events, links to donate, links to volunteer. Um, we are going to have a volunteer event on uh, next week starting with our virtual phone banking because phone banking is any, something you can do from anywhere uh, right here in your home so we'll be having a training on sunday so please check out the website lisawelch.org to get that link to volunteer to make the phone banking um, i do need your donations um, obviously my opponent takes money from some very big corporations and very big packs and uh, we're going to have to be able to fight that and be able to get our information and word out so that we're representing the people and not those big places. So please do consider donating. Do not ever consider that your donation is too small to make a difference because it's not. Um, every dollar makes a difference. When 10,000 of you vote or uh, send a dollar a month, that really honestly is our budget. So don't think that your donation is too small or you're insignificant in that manner. So please donate. And then the last thing I wanna ask you to do is not be a democratic wallflower this election, right? Everybody is now motivated to see change. Things that we've, that we've all, that people have sidelined before are now front and center. People want to talk about the virus. They want to talk about healthcare. They want to talk about their employers not protecting them at work. They want to talk about not having paid sick leave so they can be at home. They want to talk about these things. Now's the time to talk about them as a Democrat. Do not be a wallflower. Get out there, talk to your neighbors, talk to your uh, coworkers, and uh, let's get this nation turned around. Okay, so that's our time. Thank you, Jeremy. Hey, thank you so much for having me and thank you to everyone who tuned in and especially those who ask questions. I always love to hear from voters. It is my most favorite part of campaigning. So, all right, see y'all next week. We'll be doing this again. And uh, next week we'll have, uh, we'll be talking about mental health. So that'll be our topic next week. Thank you.